AI. It doesn't have domain-specific knowledge. So if you ask Alexa or Google Voice a question around agriculture, its ability to give you the response you need in the structure that you need it is highly limited. And that's because the context part of that is missing from the AI framework. That is what we've built to grow. That framework can help people discover information and ask really tough questions, whether about the future or today, in different ways. It can be accessing data in the form of visual charts, which is what we're most commonly used to. But it also does mean that we can create voice products that help us find what we need faster. It also means that we have chat mechanisms that let us do that. So another product we've actually built is a chatbot. You can integrate it into any chat system and ask Grobot questions that you have. And Grobot will give you the exact response that you need as opposed to giving you a list of websites to pick from, the data to download, to understand, interpret, et cetera. That's really what we've done. Now, how did we do it? The process of building. If you think about agriculture, there is actually a wide range of sources that are out there, both in the public domain plus in the private domain. What is difficult about these sources is that, A, they're incredibly complex depending on what kind of data you're looking at. It can be imagery, it can be government reports and structures, it could be survey data, it could be trade organizations, customs, it's kind of limitless in terms of the range of sources that you can get. So we basically identified these sources and we created an engine to clean and translate this data. By clean and translate, I mean simply just taking everything in its raw form and doing actual language translation because the best data about China is reported in Mandarin. The best data about Brazil is in Portuguese. The best data about Argentina is in Spanish. In India, it's multiple languages in one report. So building that sort of mechanism to say, I'll take data in any format, but I'll also translate that data and I'll clean it up. Once it's been cleaned, it goes through this transformation process, which is this translation, this real translation engine that we've built, which is an ontology. Think of an ontology as a dictionary. It's a dictionary that has all of these terms defined. Right now, our dictionary has over 20 million terms related to global agriculture that are defined. So these terms can relate to climate, but they can also relate to demographics. Everything that has been cleaned and translated actually gets normalized through this ontology. And what makes an ontology special and necessary for agriculture is actually that building a typical taxonomy or a classification system like we're used to creates all sorts of restrictions in terms of how we think about relationships between markets. You have to decide whether a tomato is a fruit or a vegetable. But even more complicated is actually clustering of regions. You know, we're always defined by political boundaries as opposed to regions that actually might have some type of uh, climate relationships. Or in global sugar markets, there's all sort of region clusterings that actually have nothing to do with political boundaries. This ontology allows us that flexibility to have a simple district belong to seven regions of the world including some regions where a region in Brazil is actually mixed with a region in southern Africa for some reason. So all of that essentially gets pulled into this platform that we've built, which has an API. The API is what powers essentially whether it's the visual product, the voice product, the chatbot, et cetera. It's that infrastructure. Now, today within Grow, we have over 100 sources in multiple formats and languages. Again, a source is actually an organization. So for example, the USDA alone, which we think of as a single organization, actually provides us with 3,000 subsources that are in GROW. So think of 100 as organizations, but there's actually thousands and thousands of sources that come in multiple formats and languages. We'll take data, FTP, APIs, Excel spreadsheets, emails, we'll scrape what's on a website. Uh, but the worst format of data we deal with is oftentimes government reports where people scan onto PDF files and they basically load a picture on it and the picture is like twisted. So you can't even extract. So the optical recognition that you actually have to have in place to understand what that is, is, is quite <laughs> an immense challenge. We have over 20 million data series. So th think of this as the unique indicators that I mentioned. And there's over 300 trillion data points that we're processing daily. So what do you do with all of that? One thing is just enable access. But the other is sitting on 300 trillion data points about all things global food and agriculture tells you a lot about humanity and helps you predict a multitude of outcomes linked to the agricultural ecosystem. 
Examples are you can forecast yields at very localized levels, or you can forecast drought, or you can forecast demand, or you can actually do really long-term food security analytics in a way that you haven't been able to before. You can connect dots between countries, between crops, and that's really what AI is about. It's about finding these uncommon relationships versus using the only things that we know in a very kind of tight defined process. So this allows for discovery on a new level. But for us, all this predictive analytics is still about domain expertise meeting machine learning. Meaning that building a model just because you have data without any real context and domain knowledge is a really dangerous path. So all the models that we have built and launched marry these two worlds together. So we have in-house hydrologists, plant scientists, market research analysts that sit side by side with world-class engineers that have never worked on agricultural problems. And they say, how do I take your plant process growth model and convert that into a general scalable model, which is what we did with yield forecasts to start. With yield forecasts, we initially started with corn, soy, and wheat yield forecasts that are now actually performing better than the market benchmark. We release numbers faster than any government agency. Our models run every single day at the district level uh, throughout the entire growing season. Now, what that does is our ability to predict risk and our ability to understand disasters well in advance goes up exponentially. Our ability to understand regions that maybe we don't have as much visibility to also goes up a lot. So, I'm just giving you three quick examples here, and I'm going to jump through this, but you know, we started with the easiest market in the world. We went with U.S. corn. We built a model that outperformed the markets. We then went to Argentina and did soybeans, and we actually had to solve an interesting class of problems there because Argentina, unlike the U.S., doesn't have as much data that they report, but they also actually have a lot of bias in their reporting. So the government systematically actually has some biases. So we had to build models that could detect the biases to remove bias from reporting. We then also had to determine which fields are actually growing soybeans. Because unlike the US, Argentina does not tell you which fields have soybeans. So you have to look at satellite imagery, 30 meter resolution throughout the entire country and determine which fields are actually growing what crop. So we built classifiers to identify corn, then to identify soy, and then actually to identify wheat. And when we did wheat, we moved it to India. And the reason we moved to India is that Argentina, while it had all the data quality problems I mentioned, actually still has really large farms, similar to that of the US. India presented challenges that are much similar to the African context, small scale farms. How do you do in-season forecasting on a daily basis for every district of a country that has a bunch of two acre farms. That's really the problem we solved for. But what was really cool about going through this process was that the same engine essentially built all of these models. So our ability to start and launch, start and launch just goes up exponentially because it was a generalizable framework, which was the key part to all of this. Now, like I said, the challenges in modeling in Argentina and India in, in many, many ways actually translate to the African challenges, which is short history for sub-national level yields, noisy and sparse survey data, and not always accurately reported. Inputs, we cannot get masks from each country as to what field is growing what crop. And you also have the multiple season problem, i.e. within a single year, you're trying to forecast production for the year, but more importantly, you need to forecast production for the season. So that problem we actually tackled really largely in Argentina, which for soybeans actually has a lot um, of implications. So the answer to the pop quiz, which Rose said was soybeans is correct, is soybeans. It was soybeans in Argentina. And it cost $3.9 billion. This was just in January through March of this year. Now, why is that a big deal? 3.9 billion was actually Argentina and Uruguay, but 3.4 was Argentina. That is actually the largest climate disaster that it has faced thus far. However, all the crops were actually insured. So that did allow for all sorts of mitigations in the markets, et cetera. And the reason that was the case is because models like ours actually existed and were predicting the disaster long before it was unfolding. So why is a drought? in Argentina a big deal? It's the world's third largest soybean producer. The world's third largest soybean producer having a drought 
when the U.S. is having a trade war with China and China's alternatives are Brazil or Argentina actually is a big deal. And what this has resulted in is this year, China actually doesn't really have much bargaining power as to where it will get its soybeans from, regardless of what tariff policies end up, because there's not enough in storage in South America right now. So you can th think of all the ramifications of all that actually has down to a lot of African countries. So how did our mo model perform versus the market benchmark? The market benchmark is the USDA. The red line is our yield model. Two things that you can see. One, our model is changing every day. So you actually see the number progressing. You don't have to wait every month to get an update. The second thing is that it actually initiated much lower on the total production number than the market did. So starting point itself, while it adjusted downwards throughout the season, we'd already predicted it would be a really bad year. And that actually did help a lot of insurers in South America. So forecasting is one thing, like I said, but understanding is the next. This is the context part. This is the AI. And so what we then do is we take these forecasts and we contextualize them in the trade flow picture, in the pricing information, and actually predict the entire matrix because that's ultimately what everybody cares about. That's really what we spent everything and all of our time building. This AI is crop agnostic. This actually works for strawberries and lettuce as much as it does for corn, wheat, and soy. And it's region agnostic. It's global. So it works in any context. It works in large uh, scale farming economies, it works in small scale farming economies. It really translates across the board and seeing the connected dots between those is actually what is the most critical thing to get here. So the fun technical challenges that one goes through when doing this is A, the sheer volume of data. It's 300 trillion points, it's petabytes of data, you're figuring out how you process that cheaply enough so that your customers don't have to pay an exorbitant price in exchange for you having to build this massive system. The source and data quality problems. So all sorts of data quality and reporting issues that your systems have to learn how to automatically detect. It's impossible to do this manually. So you have to build systems that learn how to automate all of this process. Reporting formats, languages, imagery computations, which then just run up your computational costs, so you really have to think of what that looks like. How do people access it? The API, a visualization, a bot? What does that, that mechanism by which people access it is, you know, we, we have a new prototype we're building where a coffee scent emerges when coffee prices go up. Who cares? It's being fed by the same system. It's just a signal. However you want that signal delivered to you, it can be delivered. There's the infrastructure, the automation, the scaling, the language, and then most importantly, the converting that data into intelligence, which is really at the heart of what we care most about, because that's really how you drive decisions. That's how you change markets. And so with that, um, I have a question for the audience, which is we want to actually launch our first African country uh, maze model on an open source basis. So which country should we do it for first? <laughs> what? Ghana? I heard Ethiopia. Kenya? All right, we'll, we'll pick one. We'll try to build some consensus, but we will actually launch one in the next six months. We'll make sure that one is fully live. That's one of the things that we actually commit to is that all our models are open source. So there's nothing we build in a black box. You want to understand the methodology by why all this happened? It's all the methodology is published. You can actually go replicate it if you wanted to. If you wanted to go build your own yield model using our infrastructure and our baseline, you could. And that's really what we want to drive. We want to drive innovation. We want people to take what we've built and build many, many applications on top of it. The range of problems we can solve is unlimited. We will never solve all of them alone. And so the idea is who wants to solve problems, who's interested in them, and how do you actually work together to do that? So we're simply an infrastructure, an idea generator, and then we pass it on. So with that, I finish off my conversation. Thanks. Let's give her a round, a warm round of applause, Ethan. That was pretty good. Pretty interesting.
And Sarah, I think it's only fair since we're in Rwanda this time around, you should start that program in Rwanda. I, I, that's just me. I, I, there's lots of questions out there, I'm sure, about uh, you know this AI system. Is it hackable? Cambridge Analytica, anybody? Think about it. That's really interesting, amazing. Thank you, well done. Next up, these TED style talks, by the way, you are free to use that. We have a handheld mic over here, but I know Sarah was saying, you know, punching all this stuff, remote control and mic is it's a little difficult. But Onyeka, who is up next? Onyeka Akuma, founder and CEO, Farm Crowdy. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes up. Good afternoon. I think all of us will agree that finding secure and reliable investments that provides a decent return is not always that easy. But what if I told you about a retail investment opportunity that we've proven to return an average of 15 to 30 percent annually, and the best part changes the lives of small scale farmers in Africa? My name is Onyeka Akuma. And I'm the founder and CEO of Farm Crowdy, a digital agricultural platform that's changing the way you and I can now invest in a farm and grow food for millions of people around Africa while earning 15% in return. Let me show you how we do this. Um, volume? Soybeans and chicken. I was interested. You can sign up as a farm follower or farm sponsor on Farm Crowdy by selecting from five different farms, including rice, maize, cassava, soybeans, and chicken. I was interested in chicken farming, so I had to first sign up using my Facebook profile. Then I clicked on the farm shop to select a chicken farm. Sponsoring a chicken farm would give you 40 chickens in one unit, but you can select as many units as you want. There's also a profit simulator that tells you what to expect at harvest. As soon as you sponsor a farm, a customer representative notifies the farmer about the new farm sponsor. Then, Farm Crowdy's technical field specialist uses the sponsorship to purchase the farm inputs to supply the farmer with what they need for the entire farming cycle. While the farmer is working, I get to receive pictures and videos on my dashboard, and additionally, I get the opportunity of visiting the farmer while they work. Once the farming is complete, the chickens are harvested and sold to prearranged wholesale buyers. And finally, I get my initial sponsorship back and a percentage of the profit like I was promised. Thank you so much, Farm Crowdy, for the opportunity of doing social good while making money. Just like in Rwanda. Thank you. Just like in Rwanda, many countries in Africa produce approximately three quarters of the food they eat, thanks to small scale farmers. However, despite being essential food producers, these farmers are constantly relegated to subsistence living because of three big problems. First, they are mostly unbankable and cannot access the necessary funding they need to work on their farms. Second, they don't know smart farming techniques and cannot take advantage of the extra land they possess. And third, even when they solve the first two problems, at harvest, most small-scale farmers don't know the best market to sell their farm produce in order to earn an actual living from farming. So we built Farm Crowdy to solve this problem by effectively utilizing the sponsorship we generate from farm sponsors on our website or mobile apps to provide our farmers with first quality seed, fertilizer, and labor for them to cultivate more food. Second, the necessary technical knowledge for them to now improve the yield from their farms. And third, market access for our farmers to sell their farm produce and now earn an actual living from farming as a business. Our solution functions on a business model where we split profit between the farmer, the farm sponsor, and farm crowding. 
It works by paying our farmers 40% of the profit from the farm and then paying our farm sponsors 40% of the profit from the harvest plus their initial capital invested and then farm crowd keeps the remaining 20%. This is a win, win, win scenario for everyone. Think of it as an impact plus return model, which is earning farm crowding a gross profit of approximately 5 to 7% of the total sponsorship generated on each farm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to tell you that our model is working. Since launching 20 months ago, we've worked with more than 7,000 small scale farmers across Nigeria. <clears throat> and grow their income by an average of 80% annually. This is made possible because we've generated over $4.6 million on our online platform in the last 20 months to work with these farmers as they aggregate their farms across 8,000 acres of farmland. 8,000 acres of farmland in the, across 10 states in Nigeria, growing crops from corn to cassava, soya beans, and over 560,000 organic chickens. And frankly, we can't produce farm sponsorship fast enough to meet up with the demand. Our farm sponsors line up on a waiting list, so we usually sell out our farm units in just a few hours. But that said, with over 180 million people in Nigeria, I'm using Nigeria as a case in point now, there are over $100 billion generated from the agricultural sector annually. This represents an opportunity for farm crowding to work with 38 million small-scale farms in Nigeria. But beyond that, in every African country where the necessary structure to support small-scale farming is lacking, this becomes an opportunity for farm crowding to extend its hand to countries like Ghana, to Kenya, or even Rwanda. Basically, anywhere that structure is lacking is an opportunity for farm crowding, and the addressable market is literally huge. Today, farmers welcome our help. Farm sponsors snap up farm units quickly. And now we just need you to continue to structure the right partnerships in order to scale our efforts to touch the lives of millions and millions of farmers to produce more for Africa. But people always ask me, are you the only one building farm crowd here? I say, no. We're a team of 37 with an average age of between 25 and 33. Smart individuals that have come from financial services, that have come from the technological side, and most importantly, farm operations, combining our efforts together in order to find ways of empowering small-scale farming in Africa. Agriculture is the future for us in this continent. My background is in technology and building businesses for people. And today, I devote all of my time into agriculture. And let me end with one story of a farmer we've empowered. Her name is Tomiwa. She's a 550-day-old chick farmer. So pretty much, her farm was passed to her by her grandmother. And it's 550-day-old chicks that she could only rear part time. Tomiwa did not have the capacity to expand into the 2,000 pen farm, only because all the money she could gather could only help her work on 550-day-old chicks. Farm Crowdy engaged Tomiwa, she was our first farmer, engaged Tomiwa and provided the funds for her to expand her operations to 2,000 bed pen. Tomiwa filled up her capacity and was able to raise those beds, but beyond that, she had so much emotional attachment with the farms, along with the sponsors. Because when the sponsors sponsored Tomiwa's farm, they found out Tomiwa was in a place called Ibadan in Oyo State of, Lake of Nigeria, and they found out that they could relate with the problem where access to funding, technical know-how, market to sell our farm produce was her challenge. Today, Tomiwa is doing 5,000 beds. She's moved from 550 to 5,000 beds because in those 550 beds, we're able to learn a full model of how to empower Tomiwa and grow her capacity with the right knowledge, with the right market. We've moved away from Tomiwa to other farmers around her region, but Tomiwa today is an ambassador for farm crowding. As I end my talk now, I want to encourage you. You too can become a farmer without owning a farm. By subscribing to the Farm Crowding app, download the app, follow farms, understand the process around agriculture, write in depth in what happens when we provide you with the pictures, videos, and text. 
And at the end of the day, make an informed decision, whether it's on Farm Crowdy or any other platform you find there, about how you too can now invest in agriculture and grow food for our children in Africa. Thank you. I just asked him, how did you come up with that name, Farm Crowdy, real quick? So while I was searching for a name, um, I got a couple of people to join me on the project. Um, today I call them co-founders. And in looking for a name, I just thought about the idea of getting a crowd of people together to farm. And so initially it was crowd farming, and I flipped it the other way. I said, no, let's call it Farm Crowdy, and it stuck. Ladies and gentlemen, Oyenka Akuma. Wow. You know, uh, <clears throat> I'm not name dropping here, but uh, Oprah Winfrey once told me. Uh, <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a moment. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> once told me, the future is so bright, it blinds my eyes. These folks here talking this language I can't even understand are incredible. You guys are, you're the future. And it's really, really impressive to see. So up next, folks, as we keep raising the bar here, please welcome Miss Rose Goslinger. She's CEO and co-founder of Pula. You have a choice of mic or mic? Good afternoon. My name is Rose Goslinger, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Pula. And at Pula, we develop and distribute insurance and digital extension services for smallholder farmers. Only 3% of Africans have any kind of insurance. And that despite that their major source of income is agriculture. Frankly, insurance is mostly considered a luxury product. Now, I always find that kind of strange because the biggest risk in agriculture is the weather. And often people talk, particularly in forums like this, about climate resilience and how there's so many risks in agriculture. And whenever they say that, I often think, you know, agriculture isn't a bit risky. It's extremely risky. Across East and Southern Africa, there are 140 languages at least, but the word for rain is pretty much the same across. Mvua, imvura, imbura, wemvula, imvula, zimvula. In Botswana, which is a desert country, they count their money in droplets, or pulas. And so, as pula, we ensure the rains. And last year, over 600,000 farmers across eight countries in Africa used products that we developed. Now, I do not come from a family of insurance salespeople. I come from a family of doctors. My grandfather was a missionary, and he built a hospital in Indonesia. And this is me, age five, with my best friend. My dad built a hospital in Tanzania. They did not think that this little girl would grow up to sell insurance. So let me tell you how that happened. In 2008, I was working for the Minister of Agriculture of this country, Rwanda, and my boss had just been promoted to become the new minister. She launched an ambitious plan to start a green revolution in her country, and before we knew it, we were importing tons of fertilizer and advising farmers how to apply and plant hybrid seeds. A couple of weeks into this program, we were asked to meet with the International Monetary Fund. And I remember the lady from the IMF saying, Minister, it's great that you want to enable your people to feed themselves, but what if it doesn't rain? She answered proudly and somewhat defiantly, I am going to pray for rain. That totally ended the discussion. But a couple of weeks, but on the way back to the ministry, she turned around the car to me and said, Rose, you've always been interested in finance. Do you think we could buy insurance? It's been about 10 years since, and I'm proud to say um, that I've seen agriculture insurance grow a lot. 
Traditional insurance has always relied on farm visits. You visit the farm at the start of the season, halfway through, and again at the end. And if there's a loss, you'd visit again to estimate the damages. Now that works if you have a 250 hectare farm, because the cost of the premium can easily cover for the visits. But if you have a small-scale farm in the middle of rural Africa, the cost and the maths of those visits doesn't add up. So instead, we rely on technology and data. This is an image of a satellite and a data source that we use that measures whether there are clouds or not. Because think about it. If there are clouds, then it might and it can rain. But if there are no clouds, it's actually impossible for it to rain. The satellite has been measuring that for the last 30 years, which means that we can measure for any location what the risk of drought was and put a premium on that cost. Now, because farmers have more risks than just drought, we complement that with machine learning that helps use the satellite data to guide how the season is progressing. And then we employ young rural youths, they, we equip them with tablets, they go out to the fields and they sample and measure harvests physically. That way, this year, we insured against risks like quillea birds, floods, army worms. I get a lot of questions about army worms these days. Um, and we are able to really insure these farmers. Now, this seems like the rocket science part of our work. And there certainly is rocket science and operational excellence that goes into this. However, the real challenge about working in insurance is selling it, because this is the likely look that you get from farmers if you tell and try to sell them insurance. <laughs> they don't trust insurance companies. They think, let me wait and see, or they think, I've managed all these years. Why would I spend money now? So instead of selling insurance directly to farmers, we package insurance with products that farmers actually want and need, like seeds, fertilizers, and credit. Let me give you an example. We package a bag of seed with an insurance voucher, on that voucher, the farmer will find, I'm trying to click here, the farmer will find a voucher. They can open that voucher and will find a PIN number in there. They text in that PIN or they use their app and one of our agents to register. Using that text, we can allocate them to a satellite pixel. And in the case of our seed product, we'll, use, we'll measure for the first three weeks of the season if it rains or not. If it doesn't rain, they'll get a, new, they'll get a text me message to pick up a new bag of seed and have a second chance of the season. We developed these tailored solutions for seeds, but also now for fertilizer. We just ran a pilot in northern Nigeria with a fertilizer product. We've just run a, started a pilot in Ethiopia with livestock veterinary medication. And we also package with credit, a ton of credit. Now, once we figured out that you actually shouldn't be selling directly to farmers, but should work with partners, um, we started growing fast. This product with seeds in its first season had 6,000 farmers, in its second had 40,000, and this season it's targeting over 150,000 farmers between Malawi and Zambia. The product in Nigeria just went with 1,000 farmers, about 5,000 bags of fertilizer, and the fertilizer company liked it so much that they're now packaging it with 3 million bags of fertilizer across Nigeria. Now, you think you solve a problem, and you see a new problem happening. Because in the first season, when farmers signed up, in the second season, some farmers didn't necessarily sign up again. And we asked them, hey, why aren't you signing up for this product? And they said, well, I didn't get a payout last season, so I was kind of actually expecting my money back, which is kind of a very normal thought with people, and particularly you know, with insurance. You kind of feel that the insurance company has run away with your money after a year. And so, what we had to think about, one of the problems we've been solving is actually, you know, how do you bring a tangible value to a product like insurance after a good year? Insurance, like a lot of things that we talk about in this panel, is about data. We collect a lot of data about our customers. We know their mobile number, their variety, the shop that they prefer. Their purchasing date often gives us a really good insight in their planting date. The number of bags tells us how much acres they grow, much more specifically and accurately than if they'd actually tell us. And their farm location plus the satellite data tells us whether it rains or not. And so we realized that at pretty much margin, zero marginal cost, we could start providing farmers with extremely tailored to their location digital extension services. For example, on when to apply top dressing fertilizer, depending on their rainfall, depending on their planting date and their location. Now, as a business, like we've grown this over the last three years and 
uh, somewhere in March of this year, we raised quite a bit of capital, which you know, um, has allowed our business really to grow. And people often ask me, you know, when you raise capital, wow, that's such an amazing thing. And you know, that must have been a really great day. And I actually answer them with, look, my favorite day last year was November 4th. It was a day that we actually paid out to farmers. This is a picture of a payout day that we had just outside of Lilongwe in Malawi. We paid a couple of hundred farmers, and the seed company that we're working with, honestly, even the people from the seed company didn't believe that it actually would pay. But when they saw those farmers actually getting those bags of seed, it's like something changed in them. They started believing that you know, something, this thing called insurance might actually work. A couple of weeks later, one of those farmers sent me this picture. She was so proud of her farm. Like, you know, she wanted to show us that that seed that she got, how far it had gone. That season, or that particular year, insurance, you know, insurance basically enabled her to harvest. And when people send me these kind of things and when I see that, then honestly, I'm very proud to sell insurance. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Rose Goslinger. That round of applause, please. From crowdfunding to, get this, cloud funding. Get it? No, no, okay. One person did, that's fine. I'll work with <laughs> Amazing, amazing stuff. You can sell me insurance anytime, anytime. So, by the way, folks, don't go away because I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions from the audience a little later on, so please hang out, feel free. As we go into the keynote for this afternoon, and again, just to remind you the topic, Think Agri, harnessing the power of innovation to unlock agribusiness for African smallholders. Please welcome on the stage to give us that keynote, Mr. Michael Hailu, he's director of CTA. Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you. It's a real privilege. And I find it quite intimidating you know, to be following this uh, wonderful, innovative, uh, and creative ladies. Let's give them a round of applause. I mean, this is just fascinating. I, I, I think it makes my life easier because what I was trying to promote has been ably demonstrated by what you know, the three innovators uh, have been able to do, uh, Sarah, One, Onyeka, and, uh, and Rose. I think what, we're, uh, what they have really shown us is that you know, we have world-class talent working in Africa, some of them Africans, that can help us address some of the challenges that we are facing. I think the question is, how do we scale up you know, some of these uh, experiences that we're having? Because we have a lot of these interesting innovations happening in different parts of Africa, but the challenge is, again, you know, how do we connect you know, some of these innovations? How do we partner you know, across different disciplines, across different uh, institutions, and, and really achieve results at scale? What these young entrepreneurs, I think, have demonstrated is that these challenges, you know, the challenges we have of food security, climate resilience, market access, and so on, are not insurmountable. They are showing us a pathway that enable modernization of agriculture, and that can really improve rural livelihoods. We recognize that one of the big challenges we have in, in agriculture nowadays is how do you engage young people to, you know, to be working in the sector. We know that 10 million young people are enter entering the labor market every year. Very few of them are interested in agriculture because they see it as a hard labor, paying very little. The question is how do we make agriculture cool again for these young people so that they can see, especially using 
their attraction to technology and their interest in being much more innovative and creative, you know, how can we make this happen? The Malabo Declaration at the policy level has clearly put a target in terms of creating employment for young people, you know, creating at least 30% of job in, jobs in the agricultural sector. But what we are seeing now is that is, that's not going to be achieved at this current rate. If you look at uh, the results that were uh, reported by the biennial uh, review that was conducted by the African Union, only few countries are on target to achieve this. So most, so the drive for innovation and the attraction of new technology that we see among the young people, we have to try and use it as a catalyst for, for their ambition. And I believe that digitalization, as we have seen some of the examples, can provide us a potentially profitable entry point for them with the added benefit of, of course, improving productivity, market access, and uh, ensuring sustainability. So transforming African agriculture into a modern, profitable, and sustainable business that creates decent jobs for millions of young people cannot be achieved without harnessing the power of digitalization. Digitalization affords young entrepreneurs the opportunity to create disruptive business models leapfrogging traditional stages of development. Well, we have seen again many, we have heard examples this afternoon, but also if you take the example of Halo Tractor, which offers smallholder farmers access to mechanization via an Uber like model. So, and also if you think of blockchain technology, which can be applied to entire value chains, removing the role of intermediaries and improve, improving efficiency, reducing waste, and improving food traceability and safety. So uh, CTA, my institution, our role is to support innovations in the digitalization space. We try to target young people in Africa. We also work in the Caribbean and Pacific. So we try to test some of these innovations to make them accessible uh, for smallholder producers, supporting innovators. So we're kind of intermediary to try and uh, facilitate these innovations. So for example, in the blockchain, we have recently launched a project to encourage young software developers to leverage uh, blockchain technology for smallholder inclusive value chains in Africa. So the project will provide competitive grants facilitating sharing of best practices and also building a community uh, through a dedicated portal. We have done also several other projects. I think uh, some of them really encouraging young entrepreneurs like Oneeka who have been able to develop a number of applications that are targeting different uh, value chains uh, for smallholder producers. And we are right now running a hug, uh, an agri-hack here, a pitch agri-hack, where we have early startups and uh, mi mid-level startups that are competing, you know, pro producing uh, you know, different solutions for different kinds of problems. And uh, some of them in the past have been able to turn their ideas into good businesses with the mentoring and uh, financial support that city has been able to provide. So uh, and it's very much along the line of the uh, crowd, uh, is that crowdsourcing or what, what, what was the farm crowdy that was uh, presented uh, this afternoon. So the challenge I like to present to our panelists this afternoon is how do we mainstream digitalization and leverage to make, it, to make agriculture for, uh, cool for young people again? How do we mainstream digitalization and leverage it uh, so that we can uh, address some of the challenges that we have. I think you know, when we talk about agricultural transformation, we talk a lot about inputs in terms of seeds and fertilizers and, and so on, but we should also be talking about what are some of the digital innovations that we can really mainstream to address the challenges that we have and to make uh, agriculture much more profitable and attractive for young people. As I said, we do a lot of this uh, support for many of the, uh, our, our partners. 
I, I just like to share one example of how innovative use of data has helped to build farmer trust and improve productivity and income for thousands of smallholder producers. In 2007, with support from CTA, the Igara Growers Tea Factory, a cooperative in southwestern Uganda, implemented an innovative farm mapping initiative, including the use of drones and handheld devices to profile 7,000 farmers supplying the Igara Growers Tea Factories uh, to, to factories. Equipped with sensors and cameras, drones were flown to collect data on farm location, size, and productivity, and they gathered data that helped diagnose crop health and planting efficiency. Based on analysis of collected data and their visualization, the Igara Grower Tea Factory, which is a farmer-owned agribusiness, was able to make informed decisions on fertilizer application and wastage was reduced. More accurate data provided, proved instrumental in securing better access to finance for farmers. An additional benefit was the building of trust between the IGTF and its members. The farmers now deliver all of their outputs to the factory, and this combined with more efficient use of fertilizers has led to the highest delivery of tea leaves in 15 years, 84% from previous years. And the key indicator of success here is that the Egara Gross Tea Factory will maintain this digital profiling activity after our support comes to an end. And a study that we conducted to look at how financial institutions would be providing uh, loans uh, and credit to, uh, to the EGARA uh, members, majority of them welcome the type of this digital profiling that's, that's available to make it easier for them uh, to provide uh, credit. So the EGARA Gorty Factory story is a, an example of a scalable and sustainable solution based on digitalization for smallholders that I, I believe can truly become a game changer for agriculture and agribusiness in Africa. These opportunities do not come without their challenges. For example, we know that regulations on the use of drones vary widely in Africa. Some are restrictive and others. We know that only 14 countries out of 54 African countries have any kind of regulation uh, on drone usage for civilian purposes. And out of those, some of, some of these regulations are quite restrictive. We're, we're happy that the African Union has identified drones as one of the most promising technologies for agriculture, and they have been promoting uh, regulations that can enable their use in agriculture. Also at the policy level, we know that 60% of Africans are still without internet connectivity. And we need to consider broadband. In rural communities, we need transformation in terms of connectivity, and this can only happen with major investment uh, from governments. President Kagame is a co-chair of the UN Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, and this commission has championed the message that broadband should be considered as infrastructure. So we hope that as countries invest a lot on physical infrastructure in roads and dams and all that, they should also consider investing in digital infrastructure because I think that's really the way to go in terms of connecting rural areas to markets and to uh, all kinds of services. And this definitely will improve mechanization and precision agriculture. It will also make rural areas much more attractive for young people to live and work in those, uh, in those regions. Because one of the reasons why young people really migrate into the cities is they don't find it attractive and, and comfortable uh, to live in rural areas with limited connectivity in terms of digital access. So we must support and promote young entrepreneurs who are developing digital solutions and make agricultural value chains more efficient and profitable. So as I said, uh, one of CTS real uh, emphasis has been to support these young entrepreneurs like Oneika. 
Uh, and we have, through, uh, through the years, we have supported more than 700 uh, with all kinds of uh, financial support, networking, training, coaching, and, on, and all that. So before I conclude, I would like to say that digitalization does not get the attention that it deserves in the African agricultural transformation agenda. There is so much potential and a lot to learn from, as we have heard this afternoon. Africa leads the world in mobile innovations. It's quite amazing that M-Pesa is just over 10 years and its success has been replicated all over the world. We must mobilize young African innovators, enterprises, investors, and governments to create many more success stories such as M-Pesa. There is no reason why Africa cannot be a leader in this area. And to do this, to unleash the power of digitalization to transform agriculture in Africa, we need to elevate the discussion to a much broader audience and bring all key st stakeholders together, including the private sector and senior policymakers. If digitalization is to be a game changer for African agriculture, how do we make this happen? How can we extend the potential and benefits of the digital revolution to transform agriculture and agribusiness in Africa, to create decent jobs and incomes for our use. How do we mobilize digitalization? And what's needed in terms of investment, skills, and technology to achieve this? We at CTA are committed to moving this agenda forward. I think this is one of the questions that uh, we're asking ourselves during the, this week. Uh, how are you going to lead? And we are quite willing to lead in this area in partnership with African Union Commission, AGRA, and other inter interested organizations. We are planning to convene a major international conference next year on digitalization for African agricultural transformation. We plan to launch also a major report that will draw lessons from successes and challenges of digitalization across the value chain and try to provide an insight into successful business models that can be scaled up to realize the full potential of uh, information communication technologies in agriculture and agribusiness. We had a similar uh, event uh, in five years ago here in Kigali, ICT for Agriculture, where we organized a major conference with seven, 800 people attending and that has really set uh, a number of uh, processes in place, and now we see some of those results coming out of that uh, discussion. So we hope that five years on, we can reconvene and bring in a lot more bigger audience, multi-stakeholder audience, and tackle this agenda and see how we can move to the next stage. So I welcome you to join us, especially the innovators who have these excellent ideas, I was really happy to hear that uh, Sarah is thinking of uh, bringing her innovation into Africa. So we really want to build, you know, also attract other innovators from outside of Africa as well as within the continent to see how we can pull all our energies together and mobilize digitalization to achieve agricultural transformation. So I thank you and uh, I look forward to the panel discussion and, of, of, and the interactions during the week. So thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Hailu, once again, give him a round of applause, please. <clears throat> yeah. You know, um, after seeing you guys in the presentation this afternoon, all three of you, it reminds me of um, yesterday there was a bunch of folks here from Iowa. I don't know if they're still here. You, the Iowans that were here yesterday. Reminds me of one of my all-time favorite movies, a movie called Field of Dreams. And I say this at many fora, and it's becoming more and more reality. Uh, this man hears some voices telling him to clear his maize field or cornfield and build a baseball field. It's more than that. It's, there's more to it than that. It's a movie about America, baseball, and life. <clears throat> so there's this voice that keeps coming out from the sky, it keeps saying, if you build it, he will come. If you build it, 
they will come. These platforms here, the AI platform, the Farm Crowdy platform, the crop insurance platform, you guys have built it. I mean, it's happening, it's a reality. And we congratulate you for that. Let's give them all another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so let's talk now. We've got a great panel coming up. I'd like to introduce him first. Uh, first up, Ms. Salah Goss, Head MasterCard Labs for Financial Inclusion. Round of applause, please. Ms. Amrota Abdella, Regional Director, Microsoft for Africa Initiative. <laughs> Professor Thomas Jane, Professor of Agriculture, Michigan State University, MSU. <clears throat> Eric Kaduru, Founder and CEO, CAD Africa, and the 2015 Yara Prize Laureate. Look at this young man, 2015 Yara Prize Laureate. And last not, but not least, Professor Emeritus from Syracuse University, Professor Catherine Bertini, Vice Chair and Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs, Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. All right, looks like Ms. Amrota is not here, is that it? Okay, that's right. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, folks. Uh, first of all, we'll start with you, uh, Salah. My, my credit card, my MasterCard credit card has maxed out. Can, can you? <laughs> Hello? Is this... It's on, it's on. So I think that was a prompt for me to say, actually, MasterCard is not a credit card company, right? <laughs> well done. So a lot of people don't know that we've never issued a credit card for the technology that, it, that allows those transactions to be seamless. But more specifically, the lab that I run, if I could just talk, explain that very quickly, is also we're not the foundation. So there's a MasterCard foundation as well. And philanthropy plays a great role in this space. Our challenge is to do financial inclusion with sustainable business models and alternative business models. So our lab is part of a family of labs of nine, and we basically de-risk de the future of commerce. Our lab focuses on people who make $5 a day or less in the areas that have household impact. So we build digital solutions in agriculture, education, and health. So not a credit card company and not the MasterCard Foundation. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> I'll go, I'll go in order over here. So, Professor Thomas Jane, your thoughts about this, these innovations we just witnessed a few ago? Your thoughts? My thoughts, okay. Well, they're wonderful innovations, and it's... Uh, you weren't going to say anything less, were you? Uh, no. <laughs> What's that? You weren't going to say anything less, were no, you? No, <laughs> but ser seriously, it, it really shows the, 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 the wonderful way in which new ideas and new capital are being brought to address old problems and doing it in a way that has a lot of promise. One of the things I wanted to say in this session that's really devoted to innovation is that innovation can take many forms. And uh, most of us think about innovations in terms of technology, ICTs, new ways of uh, doing things. But right under our noses for the last 10 years, there's a very important innovation that's occurred in African agriculture that many of you know about, but I wanted to highlight it here because I think it uh, plays on our theme here for this session uh, extremely well. And, and that innovation is the dramatic changes that have hap happened in the last 10 years uh, with inv new investment by uh, African investor farms. And this, this has occurred ever since world food prices started to rise about 10 years ago. You remember this, food prices tripled back around 2006, 2007. And there were many uh, Africans with savings uh, accumulated up who started to find investing in land a very profitable investment because of the rise of food prices. So uh, I'm in the business uh, at Michigan State University of trying to anticipate uh, these trends that are affecting the region and working with African governments to respond to them proactively rather than be whipsawed by them in a kind of reactionary way. So somewhere around 2008, 2009, we started to see from the data that we were examining that there was massive increases in the number of farms in Africa that were say 10 hectares, 20 hectares, 50 hectares. Uh, and this kept on growing all the way up, you know, through, well, through the present moment. And so uh, in, in some countries like Zambia and Ghana, these kind of farms, these 
African investor farms account for more than 50% of all of the farmland area under cultivation in these countries. So they're really a force to be reckoned with. And in, in the beginning, we had this fear that maybe these people were crowding out small-scale farmers and making it more difficult for young people to acquire land and to make a, a go out of farming. And uh, those fears um, are, are, are somewhat founded, but I must say that we've had to change the way we feel about this because as the evidence kept on rolling in in recent years, we're seeing that where there's a high concentration of these investor farms, uh, it tends to crowd in uh, employment and other good things that are providing jobs for rural youth. All right. Hold that thought, Prof. Thanks for that. Okay. Eric Kaduru, first of all, remind folks here who didn't know what you won your prize in. Tell us what it was about and what you've been up to since. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, glad to be here. Um, so my organization, CAD Africa, is actually a commercial farm, and we work with out-of-school girls uh, aged 14 to 24. So we provide them with access to land uh, through a very innovative, um, oh, sorry, oh, that's better. Um, we provide them with access to land with a very innovative um, deal we've had going with um, various religious institutions, the Catholic Church, Anglican Church, and a few mosques around our area. And the girls go through a six-month curriculum, life skills, financial literacy, health and hygiene, sexual education, and it's all focused around agriculture, obviously. So we grow passion fruit, and then my organization, Cat Africa, buys it all back and sells it to the open market. We're in the process of um, moving into value addition. So setting up a factory to start pulping, which will enable our farmers to get better prices. It'll enable us to have better shelf life so we can actually export to different markets like the US. And yeah, and just to piggyback on the, the land issue, it's funny you mentioned that a lot of people were buying land because a lot of people were also selling land. And that's mainly the young people because they are looking for opportunities elsewhere, moving out to the city, so they'll sell their land to other people who have access to cash. So it's just an interesting uh, aspect. Yeah. yeah, exactly, two sides of the coin. Sure, and it's strictly women, young, young women. Yeah, so we're trying to scale up, obviously, and the only way to do this is to have our women graduate into other programs. And normally, I've just been a very against the whole tech, tech farming thing until today. <laughs> Today I've been convinced by, by you three guys, because that's crazy, like the access to information, first of all, knowing uh, patterns, weather trends, that is critical information for young farmers to have this knowledge. Um, access to funding. Now crowdfunding, that's, a, that's one of the most innovative things I've ever heard when it comes to like people raising capital through other people who are just generous about it. With no terms, you know, you don't have to go put up your house as collateral, you don't have to do any of that. You just click on, sign up, and some nice person in Iowa decides to, to pay for your farm, that's amazing. That's, yeah. And the crop insurance, probably one of the most important things, because it just, it, it adds leverage to the, to the farmers, and then the finances are also secure, because they're like, okay, if everything goes to shit for better terms, you know, I get my money back. <laughs> So I, I'm just very happy to be here, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. I, I know exactly how, what you mean and how you feel. Professor Catherine Bertini, uh, Eric here mentions his organization is strictly women. You must be happy to hear that. Yes, yes, you know I'm very happy to hear that. I've been working a lot on, on gender issues for a long time, uh, not only with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, uh, but also uh, when I was with the World Food Program. And, the, and in fact, I was recognized uh, by the World Food Prize Organization for that work on gender. So when I hear Eric and when I heard the young people earlier, I thought, I think this generation is thinking about 
women and men, girls and boys differently than our generation has, and I applaud them for it, because they're thinking first about how their programs are actually reaching people, real people. And you, you heard that from Pula, uh, and you heard that from uh, Farm Crowding, and you heard it from Eric, because they're starting from the perspective of the farmer or the, or the person in the field. And that is what we didn't do. You know, we went somewhere, we, I mean, an older generation, we'd go somewhere and say, hi, we've got this great expertise, and we're here to help you, and we're going to talk to whoever shows up to come and, and talk to us about this great thing. And it wasn't necessarily the people that were really working and the people that were sustaining their families and working in the field. So, so to start from there is brilliant. Just this morning, there was a session on nutrition and Dr. David Navarro was the keynoter on that, and Ruth Onyango and, and, and Namanga and Gongi and others were on that panel and making the point that R Ruth especially uh, uh, vigorously making the point that we have to start by talking to the people who are actually sustaining families and actually working in the villages. And all of these things are doing it. I think this, this, these programs that were talked about today are like, um, using soft power to help hard labor. Yeah, that's deep, that's deep. <laughs> I had to think about that for a moment, but you're right. Folks are gonna be coming to questions from the floor very shortly, so um, get, get your questions ready. And when you do that, you tell us who you are, who you represent, and who the question is directed to. And then we'll keep that going. In the meantime, yeah, you want to add? Yes, a lot. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to what's been said, and I think there's a theme running through. I mean, the the brilliance of the the presentations that we saw. Part of that is the understanding and the fluency in very technical subjects, but I think what really makes them grounded is I think they're all centered around the people that they're targeting. So when you think about a lab, there's, you know, we have access to lots of very smart people, even throughout MasterCard doing AI and computer intelligence and all that. But a lot of times we focus on business model innovations, not just technology. And I think the power of that is wrapping that around how people live and work, and that is what makes technology sustainable. Yeah. If it's not, um, we were talking, I was just talking, um, we were talking about go-to-market model. So the pool, you saw the insurance. It's like, almost like a stealth go to market. So you wrap it around something that people value. And I just wanted to kind of tee that up. We're here to talk about technology, but I think a lot of times we think about business model innovation and, and how can that be human-centered in the sense that it actually resonates with the people you're trying to reach. And that takes knowing how they live and work, and that takes starting with the farmer. Yeah. Uh, Professor Thomas Jane, d d d people have been talking about how to make farming sexy. You know that key word, sexy, cool. I mean, listen, okay. look at this, man. I mean, this is a game changer here. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I've had problems with that terminology. <laughs> uh, I think that as long as you make it profitable, people are going to go into it. And so what makes things sexy is making it provide a nice livelihood. And if, that, if we can make agriculture serve the interests of people who are engaging in it so it gives them good, good money, they're going to come in. Yeah, Eric, you're nodding. No, I I completely agree. The, like, the sexiness, the coolness, or, or the, the whole the, the idea of making farming sexy is yeah, it's a bit misleading mm. because it it starts to like you know make things like a fantasy world because the newspapers will write an article saying oh this farmer earns this much but that's not the reality. The reality is people need to be educated on agriculture before they go waste all their money trying to be sexy a sexy farmer. That's that's just craziness. So, like, the education of young farmers is the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sexiness yeah. comes later. Comes later. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also educating the people that Eric is, is, is designed to educate, his programs are designed to educate, because otherwise, uh, sometimes when we think about farming and we think about the commercial aspects of it, we just automatically go to the, to the male role, the male money role, the male management role, the male me mechanical role. And so reaching out to girls, to people who are, who are rural and young and female, uh, so have the, both the positive and the negatives that 
come with all of that to be sure that they have the education and the, um, the access to be able to use these new tools um, will help them be able to, to be profitable as well. Otherwise, they're sometimes left out of the equation because they don't have land, access to land, because they don't have lack access to credit. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, the majority of the farmers in rural Africa are women. Okay. So like, the only way to change like, ideas, household mentality, is through mothers, daughters, sisters. Because once the money goes into the hands of the guys, mm -hmm. it starts getting sexy, and then we have <laughs> Problem. Problems. <laughs> in, in more ways than one, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mean, yeah. All right, Eric, you're banned from using that word from now on, okay? <laughs> Salah, you were talking about the platforms that you have at MasterCard. Please explain to us real quick. Platforms. Sure, so we build uh, digital solutions. You can call them platforms, you can call them solutions. So through the par a partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we started the lab. And the idea behind that, so our solution are in those areas that not only should give you a why for financial inclusion, because no one wakes up and says, I want a bank account. They want to pay school fees, they want to keep the lights on, they, they want to earn more in agriculture. Choice of farmers will be crucial. And then to your you know, point, um, there, there needs to be profits. There needs to be profitability in farming, which will come from you know, good agricultural investments by the public sector, coming in private sector, just the kind of traditional investments that are necessary to catalyze agricultural productivity growth. Professor and, Martini. Mm -hmm, okay, please. I think there are potential networks that could be connectedly put together, uh, farm cooperatives with, uh, with uh, agriculture, uh, 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 sales representatives, supply representatives with banks so that they can do some connected, I think, to the farm crowding kind of idea, which could potentially get to other kinds of farmers. Then there's the network that used to be called, that the World Food Program runs, used to be called Purchase for Progress, uh, again, where they're working with different uh, uh, cooperatives or just groups of farmers, help them to be able to prepare to sell to WFP and to other commercial uh, purchasers. So uh, it, it's another network. Yeah, as you know, since morning from the young, you know, since this afternoon from the young people. Great. Because, you know, this, this is really means to an end. Car farms, 10 acre farms, you know, with all these tools available. Otherwise, it's like we walk a path. To create, it's a very broad question, but in looking at the, the grow intelligence, I would, I would look at it in the sense of like creating regional hubs. So if we have weather patterns for certain areas, we know when the rain's gonna fall, we know what crops grow well there, it might be better to try and start aggregating smallholder farmers to work together in cooperatives. Because in Uganda, specifically, units. So like using... In 2018, where we are right now, the vast majority of farms are... So we have no choice except to think about where we want to be in relation to where we are today. So you're quite where we might want to be. And my guess is that with good and organically derived farms, there, and uh, there, there's evidence to suggest that farms that are sort of in the middle uh, are providing very positive synergies back to small-scale farms. Mm. Dr. Gabriel Martin, Chief Happiness Officer, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I think that's the part. No, that's a very good point. Um, so the kind of research that, that we need to do nowadays has to be relating to websites and uh, making it accessible in ways that it, 20 years ago it would never have been accessible to African farmers given um, the kind of technologies that we have now. So, um, you know, there's been other sessions here that have talked about innovations, uh, for example, in soil testing that can be done um, with these little kits that get, uh, you know, the, the results of these soil tests get uh, sent into areas where they're analyzed and then brought back to the farmer in a way that they can utilize. Um, that would never have been possible 20 years ago. So I think you're right that we, there's all sorts of ways in which uh, this new generation of farmers can be reached and supported 
more effectively given current technologies. So, yeah, Kirui, let me ask you a question. Are you worried about this new type of farmer with the happy socks and the flat top, you know, the buzz cut? Are, are you worried about this new type of farmer? I'm actually very enthusiastic about them and oh, okay. I'd like to be part of Good. <laughs> We're not a threat. <laughs> Caleb, go ahead. All right. All right, my name is Caleb Karoga from Kenya. I'm a farmer. And I got <coughs> caught up in the farming is cool, it's sexy. And I have, I'm still smarting from the loss to date. I'm from the loss. To a point, I, I like to be honest, to a point I feel, and I stand to be corrected, that um, when the revolution started happening in the digital space, we told young people, come and get into farming is sexy, it's cool. But are we um, talking more about the software, quote unquote, of farming, and forgetting about the hardware of farming, where we tell these people, besides you having tech, you need to develop or grow a culture, pun intended, grow a culture of resilience. This is what our grandfather was doing without the tech, and they're doing very well. But we are pushing get many people to get into farming, but there's that culture that they don't have. If your car is broken, you go to a mechanic. If you're sick, you go to a hospital. What if when you fail along the law, said as a farmer, when your tech doesn't work, who do you go to? That's my concern. Before you, before you answer that, Caleb, do you regret? I don't regret, um, but I've gone through more hell than... <laughs> I've gone through more hell, but I've learned... I've, I've gone to, to the school of life, and I've learned what doesn't work and what works. So when I go to the, to the rural areas and I talk to the farmers, they have good tech, they have the greenhouses but they're all dead. It's not working. So we start from scratch. Where did you go wrong? Mm -hmm. My observation. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. This is exactly what I was saying, like making it cool, making people rush into it. The key to this is educating them before. Because mm -hmm. I learned the same way you went through that. I went through it at the beginning. I'm still going through it. Farming is unpredictable. Anything can happen. Global warming, we're suffering every day. So like you have to be educated on what you're doing, yeah. research. You don't go to a guy in the village who just says, ah, yeah, I can cure cancer with, with leaves. You go to a doctor because the doctor is educated in curing whatever disease you have. So go to agronomists, go to people who have knowledge in what they're doing. Uh, liaise with the, with the specialists in the industry before you get into it. Don't get caught up in the cool aspect. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, good point. Good yeah, yeah, this farming is sexy stuff can backfire uh, on us unless we're willing uh, you know, to basically put the resources in and the education and so forth to make it work. It's and I appreciate this gentleman's uh, getting up and uh, you know, uh, indicating how he may be one of many people who have uh, kind of gotten in under this mantra yeah. of uh, agriculture is sexy and cool. By the way, he was a great journalist before. Maybe he should have just stuck to that. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Ambassador, your turn. Thank you very much. I'm Ambassador Philip Idro from Uganda. Um, I want to remind everybody on a meeting called by Mr. Hailo in Nairobi, CTA, when we discovered that the problem of blindness of banks was because most of the staff were accountants and economists. And until they employed agricultural staff, they could not see agriculture as viable. Yeah. That was a very big change, which I thought we required. And I'm glad in Uganda we are seeing changes, because now more and more banks are employing agricultural officers to go into the banks and give them the meaning of agriculture. Otherwise, the banks originally were on trade and industry. I think that was the first one which I want to remind you. The second one was what I need to say has been the history of the transformation of the Western world in financing agriculture. From the 1960s, in the beginning, it was projects. Soon after, they discovered that the projects were too narrow, they went into programs which were wider and broader. After that, the question was, should it be rural development or should it just be projects or programs? And they veered, the World Bank veered, the World Bank veered into rural development. And thereafter, there was a bit of confusion 
And when the issue of highly indebted countries came up, they devalued the currencies and there was structural formation. And again after that, it was water for all, education for all, health for all. And you can see the transition of big money coming from Europe and America in that format. And these are small countries. So while we're concentrating to look at the ideas and the innovations in Africa, what was the ideas and transformation in the Western world, which were so big that they affected us grossly, and they still do today. And so when we see now private financing, crowd financing, it's again a major impact coming from the Western world, let alone China, which was not there before. So it's good for us to talk about the issues here, but it is also important to see the global dynamics because they are heavy. Now I am glad in this conference here and somewhere in some areas, I see the importance of dialogue, I see the importance of collaboration, I see the importance of coordination, and I see the importance of convergence. It's also innovative and it is coming on board. But the major issue which I want to end with is this. I did calculations in Uganda. I found that whereas we have over one million cars, we have only 5,000 tractors. And I know in Nigeria there are about 12 million cars, but I think there are only 40,000 tractors. Can't you have bought tractors instead? Of course you could have, but with the attitude. And if I calculate how much beer we drink, and I'm not talking of Safaricom, I am not even talking of other aspects. If I tell you how much we spend on fuel, and uh, ladies, I know how much we spend on our mascara. These are very big finances which are available for agriculture. I thought I should end there. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, you, Eric, you want to comment on that? A few, a few things, Mr. Ambassador. Because um, obviously, you speak from a perspective of Uganda, and you ask why people are getting money from the West, but the policies in the country are what is, you know, crippling the agricultural sector. You go to a bank to get a loan with an interest rate of 25, 24%. Who, who's going to take that? When a VC comes in and says, oh, we'll give you 9%, I'd be a crazy person to go to the bank in Uganda. So that policy is just, it's not serving the people. So like, I don't know. When you were speaking, I was just like, oh. It's, it's nice to hear, but I have to disagree on several fronts. And I mean, as the ambassador, maybe this is something you can bring up <laughs> when you're back in Uganda, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Good. Back in Uganda, okay? <laughs> Two more questions and then we wrap up, folks. Go ahead. There's one in the back there and then you. Hi. Uh, my name is Neeraj Shah. I work with the IFC, so I have a nice segue to the ambassador's comments. Um, I have a question for Eric. I run a blended finance facility called the private sector window of the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, CAFSP. Uh, one of the um, principles that we follow is we invest with IFC in companies that are commercially sustainable mm -hmm. because the expectation is that you can't keep giving grants or subsidies forever. Eventually, you have to make money. And that uh, uh, was the other comment that agriculture has to be profitable. So Eric, uh, question for you is, are you profitable? How long have you been in business? And how did you actually fund your business? Because that was the point you just made, and that's something we've seen everywhere. And do you have any local currency related issues? Because you seem to be export oriented, so is it that you can actually take dollar funding and you can repay that? Or how sustainable is your funding source? Sorry, a bunch of questions, but thank you. Okay. Um... I've been doing this for eight years now. I've been farming for eight years. Am I profitable? Not yet. Where did I get my funding? My initial funding came from myself and my wife's um, savings. And then, obviously, I went through the whole issue with the banks, you know, trying to get money from them, and they want collateral. They want my house against my father, which is madness. I'm not, you know, it's a risky business. Um, we got a lot of funding from outside, you know, Uganda. We do a lot of social development work, so we do get grant fund funding for some of our projects, 
but I believe that our business will be profitable in the next year if we are able to work with the government and you know change some policies and get access to, to financing locally because it, it actually it's a, a stake if they're just as committed to what we're doing as we are to what we're doing it'll help the country itself it creates more farmers it creates a, an economy that runs itself it creates jobs creates opportunities for people it creates linkage to outside markets so yeah it's i don't know if i've answered all your questions uh, most of them thank you all right how sustainable you didn't answer that one how sustainable it's very sustainable i i believe it's sustainable because we're working with our community to p create an option for them to like grow something that then we buy yeah. because if the market is exists it's sustainable mm. if i come and tell people to plant maize and then they have nowhere to sell it that's not a sustainable model and that's what a lot of ngo programs are doing a lot of organizations come out we'll give you better seed we'll give you better fertilizer you'll have higher yields but with all that if you don't have a market you're just wasting my time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's just how it is. Absolutely. Final question, sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I'm Christopher Zivamo, Deputy Secretary General, East African Community. I wish to say that uh, this time around, when it comes to speak about agriculture, actually, we should change the narrative. narrative of her seeing agriculture as a poor sector where you have poor people, where people who do not have a job have to go. Sustainable market, it is there. Our cities are growing and very, very quickly. We shall have a lot and a lot of people to feed. So the market is there. And then also the market is key. The most important thing is to see how to link adequately the producers, which are farmers, and the market in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And to guarantee that the producers actually are connected with the market. And here, I think it is a matter of mind change. Mind change not only in, at one level, but in the whole value chain. Our leaders, most of them, come from farmers, or they are they themselves farmers. And they have this traditional mindset of seeing agriculture as the poor sector. And when you discuss where to invest, it is not in agriculture where you think directly. And yet, it is the sector where you have your voters, where you have more of for the young people, the future, a sector which contributes in most cases, for more than 30% of our national GDP. So it is a matter of strategizing. The few you invest in agriculture, the more return you have when it comes to elevating poverty and increasing the wealth of uh, our population. So I have seen and heard what the young people have uh, presented here. I have followed also yesterday. And I think actually a lot is being done. They are already people who are gaining their life, getting a lot of money from agriculture. The most important then is to think adequately 
and to put your money where it is more productive and also to ensure you have the right information. <coughs> All right. Let me conclude on this. You're concluding now, right? These young people who are already involved in the agriculture sector and who are really progressing can be take, taken as role models who we can use actually to mobilize other young people to come in. And successful farmers can also play the role of being mobilizers of other people to invest in. And this is the role of our institutions, our government, to make sure we create awareness and adequately and we push people to invest rightly in the agriculture sector. Thank you. All right. So, Secretary General, you didn't actually have a question. That was just a, a statement you wanted to make. I have to, okay, no, no, I have to answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, folks, just about done over here. We would like us to wrap up. And as we wrap up, the question I'm asking you guys is, and you can use this in your conclusion, are we in a good place in Africa in terms of farming? And also, what's the next big thing? Salah, let's start with you. Oh, no time to think, huh? Um, are we in a good, I think, I mean, look, there's challenges, and we all know them. We all know the numbers. We all know um, some of the risks that we face. I do think we're in a place where we can highlight um, progress. And we can think about how we use technology to turn the size of the challenge into the size of the opportunity. So I do, I will say, I think we're looking at a lot of opportunities. I do think technology has a, has a role to play in that. So good place, I think there's, there's, there is work to be done, but I do think we can highlight the progress that's been made. Professor Thomas Jane. I totally agree. I think that we should be um, very happy about the way that Africa has been developing in the past 10 years. You, do you know that over the past 15 years, the growth rates of African agriculture has exceeded anywhere else in the world? Highest rates of growth in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 15 years. And we should uh, give thanks to, I mean, African governments are starting to do more and more of the right things. There's still a ways to go. We have innovators like the three people who uh, got up and uh, spoke and started out. They're doing innovative things. People are benefiting from it. And importantly, we haven't said this, but importantly is that there's a growing proportion of Africa's labor force that's moving out of agriculture. In, in the long run, that's a good thing. That's most developed economies of the world. You only have five or 10 percent of the labor force really being engaged in farming. And that's what happens when agriculture grows so much. It creates money in the, in the rest of the economy that helps diversify the economy. So I think we need to keep our eye on the ball here that Africa wants to uh, move to a position where it's less dependent uh, on just you know, having 80% of its labor force in farming. First, Catherine Bottini. Uh well, it's totally second what Professor Jane has said about Africa's future in agriculture and make three quick points. One is I want to challenge the, the young people that are so good at using technology to think about how to make disruptors on promoting good nutrition, especially for young people in Africa. Number two is, there, uh, is a semi uh, a, a commercial, there's a group of us who care about girls in, in agriculture and rural economies. They're going to get together tomorrow at 1.15 in TL1 in the Radisson just to talk for an hour. Anyone's invited. And three is, Jeff, you've been working for all these days on all of this work. You thank all the panelists and all the speakers. I don't know how well people thank you, and you're great. Thank you. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, they'll thank me when I'm dead. <laughs> Eric Kaduru, you get the last word. Um, yeah, I definitely think we're moving in the right direction. I think we still have a lot of work to do. Governments still have a lot of work to do, in my, my view. Um, looking at other countries that are, that are excelling, that's where other governments need to start like, reflecting. We're neighbors. Rwanda can't be excelling when Uganda is stifled. Kenya can't be doing well when Rwanda is stifled. So let's 
work together as a, a region or a continent to, to focus properly on how we can boost agriculture. And for the disruptors out there, the guys, the farm crowdy, you know, that's the kind of stuff we need. That's going to change the game for everyone. Because people who think they're in charge of financing will be shocked. Yeah. And that's what it's about. So I commend you guys. That's amazing work. Keep it up. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Round of applause, everybody. That's right. <laughs> Professor Catherine Bertini, Professor Thomas Jane, Eric Kaduru, Ms. Salagos, of course, Michael Hailu, uh, Rose Goslinger, Oyenka Akuma, Saramenka. Great panel this afternoon. Give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Another one. Yeah. yeah. And thank you. Give yourselves another round of applause as well. You guys were a great audience. Thank you for being a part of this. Let's do it again tomorrow. Same time, same place. We'll see you then. Good night. Good luck. God bless. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs>